Hello, my name is Gary Tubbs. I'm the Associate Minister for the Churches of Henham, Elsenham and Ugly, and I would like to welcome you to this service today. We are doing a series on evil, suffering, coronavirus and God. Last week, we looked at where does evil and suffering come from. Today, Simon Pilcher will speak from the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 13 about the question of suffering and personal wrongdoing. The series is based on a book by John Lennox, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Uh, you can get this from Henham Shop uh, or you can contact the church and there's details at the end of the video. We live in God's world and we're called to praise uh, our God and King. We're going to sing uh, two songs. The first one is a modern rendition of a traditional hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, uh, and it's recorded by Sovereign Grace. That's followed by uh, a song called Behold Our God, which is recorded by uh, David and Zoe Tubbs. That song encourages us to worship and adore our incomparable God. Before we have those songs, let's have a short prayer. On this Father's Day, we pray to you, our perfect Heavenly Father. May we glorify you and honour your Son, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. To the one God, Father, Son and Spirit, in loving fellowship, we offer you praise. Amen.
seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. We've just sung to God enthroned in glory, a God who speaks in his written word and through his son Jesus. Now Philip is going to read from Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 1. We'll be using the NIV UK version. You can follow it in your own Bible or you can, uh, you can Google it. Afterwards, Simon will speak and then Sandy will lead us in our prayers. Today's reading is Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galatians whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that those Galatians were worse sinners than all the other Galatians because they suffered this way? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. I'm Simon Pilcher. I'm a member of the congregation in uh, Hannah, Melsnam and Ugly. And uh, this morning we're going to be thinking about the question, is suffering necessarily connected with personal wrongdoing? Uh, we're thinking of a broader topic of suffering, pain, coronavirus and God. And uh, today I want us to think about, well, pain and suffering and death. And how can we make sense of it? Why do we experience it? How do we respond to it? I want to start by saying that suffering is obviously intensely personal. Uh, questions flow from it like an unending stream. And maybe for you, that stream is, well, more of a torrent. The physical and emotional pain of what you or a loved one are experiencing can be horrific. Is there any hope for the future? Will it ever end? Now, we know deep down in our guts that suffering and death, well, they're not right, are they? They shouldn't be here. But deep down, we know that things are not as they should be. Mind you, not all pain is bad, is it? Um, if you think of uh, putting your finger in a flame, you know to remove it. Uh, if you experience the tightness in your chest, well, you know that you need to get to a doctor, get medical help fast. Uh, several years ago, 10 years in fact, my father had a triple heart bypass. And my sisters and I are intensely grateful that he had that warning. He received extraordinary care and here we are 10 years on and dad has a good quality of life. How wonderful to have that warning. All of us will experience pain and suffering at some point in our lives. And many of us have much to endure now, mental, physical, emotional. How do we react to it? What sense are we to make from it? Well, our personal worldview will deeply impact what we make of it. Atheism says that suffering just is. Atoms move around, things just happen. There's no such thing as morality. We live in a world of blind, pitiless chance. One where there is no judge and where there is no true basis for determining right and wrong. Atheism doesn't offer any help and no hope either. You suffer? Tough. I was deeply struck by a true story that a former minister in these villages told. 
uh, before he came to the UK, Dub Gannon, uh, was an agronomist. He worked with farmers. And uh, farming in Australia is a pretty tough enterprise. Dub tells the story of a cotton farmer whose crop was almost ready for harvest. Now, cotton is a very, very expensive crop to grow. And this guy had no insurance. And then a massive hailstorm came in and obliterated his crop, completely destroyed it. And in the space of just an hour, this guy lost quite literally millions. He was ruined. Well, a neighbour came round, and knowing that this farmer was a believer, he berated him. The God you trust has just sent a hailstorm to wipe out your entire crop? How can you believe in God when that happens? You fool! And the Christian farmer, with tears in his eyes, replied, quoting scripture, the words of Job, from Job chapter 1. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How we can react when we're confronted by evil and suffering and pain will be a function of how we view the world. Some, like that farmer, will echo those words of Job, who suffered more than I would wish on anyone. But Job kept his trust in God through it all. Maybe you can relate to the words of the psalmist, who says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea. Well, others will say that what goes around comes around, that all things that happen are a direct act of God to judge people. So that farmer in Australia, well, he was being punished by God, I don't know, for maybe some secret sin that he'd committed. And people of various religions will say that this disease or that tsunami or this act of violence are ways in which God dishes out vengeance. They say, oh, he had it coming to him, or your faith isn't strong enough, or this disease is God's judgment on, and then they'll mention some section of, community, of the community that they don't like. But I want to say that's a very crude response. In fact, I want to go further than that. I want to say that it's a wrong response. And it causes huge hurt. Yet others will say that what we experience in this life is a result of what we've done in a prior life. So you're poor or you suffer ill health or maybe a child dies young. Well, they'll say you must have been very evil in a previous life, Simon. It's payback time. You have to atone for your previous crimes. This is karma. But this, too, is a brutal and heartless way of thinking. Imagine hearing that if you're the one who's suffering. Christians believe that it is not right to say that suffering is always a result of things that we have done wrong. Now, the Bible is clear that much suffering is the direct consequence of human wrongdoing. And on some occasions, for instance in the story of Job, we hear of God permitting Satan to wreak havoc. At all times, God limits the power of Satan. It's as if he keeps him on a very short leash. But Christians believe that God is always sovereign. He's always in control. And that we can never say that evil comes from him. There are times, though, when we read in our Bibles that God is acting in judgment on an individual or on a group. But we only know this because we're told it from God's perspective. So in a number of places of history, we're given God's perspective, his verdict on the events. And without God's clear explanation, without his interpretation, we cannot jump to conclusions that any particular tragic event is God's act of judgment on anyone. So today, we don't have the authority to say 
why something is happening. We're not God. The story of Job is a heart-rending one. Uh, he suffered so much. Much of his family were murdered brutally in two separate incidents. And then the rest of his children, and he had ten in all, died in fire and then in a windstorm. But the whole point of the book is that Job was not to blame for his suffering. He had done nothing to deserve this, despite what his friends went on to say. They wanted to pin the blame on him. They said, Job, this must be God's judgment on your wrongdoing. But God's verdict, God's explicit statement, is that it is the friends who are the ones who are in the wrong, not Job. We cannot blame the sufferer when they experience violence or bad fortune. Instead, we should stand with them. We should support them. We should encourage them. We should pray for them. We should pray with them. Well, we saw last week that Christians believe that the reason why we live in a messed up world is that we've rejected God. Each one of us has turned our back on him. Each of us thinks deep down that, frankly, we know best. And the consequences of our rebellion against God's good rule is that we live in a world where suffering is very much the order of the day. And sometimes the consequences of one person's sinful act are clear and identifiable. We can see who's on the receiving end. But sometimes they're not. So this family is in anguish because their father was killed by that person. But think about the selfish overconsumption of so many of us in the rich world and its dreadful consequences for many residents of the poorest countries on earth. We can't link the suffering of individual A to the selfish behaviour of person B. But when I sin, others do get hurt. Now, of course, all of us are sinners, and so not one of us is in a position to complain that it's unfair if we suffer because of the sins of someone else. I mean, what about those who suffer because of my wrongdoing? It's all immensely sad. Christians believe that 2,000 years ago, God stepped into this world in order to deal with this mess. He took on flesh and blood and he became a man. And if you'd been in, I don't know, Jericho or Galilee or Jerusalem at the right time, you could have met God. Jesus of Nazareth was his name. Now in today's reading from Luke's account of Jesus, we first hear Jesus talk about state-sponsored murder. Pilate, who was the Roman governor of the time, had slaughtered some pilgrims. They'd come to the temple to worship. They were going about their business, and an evil regime had brutally butchered them. And Jesus is clear that there was nothing about these people that meant that they had especially deserved it. Jesus says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no. Jesus says, don't pin the blame on them. In just the same way, it would be a scandal, frankly, to suggest that the young people blown up at an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester or the man in a Minneapolis street who died when a policeman was kneeling on his neck were in any way getting what they deserved. No, says Jesus, that is not right. Well, Jesus then speaks about a tragic accident. A building had collapsed and 18 people had died. Did they have it coming to them? Were they, in Jesus's words, more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. In the same way, it would be plain wrong to conclude that those 
who've suffered from coronavirus or AIDS were particularly evil. Jesus will not let us draw those conclusions. But we live in a world where tragedies sadly happen. Both natural disasters and great moral outrages routinely occur. Now, I said earlier that not all pain is bad. It warns us that something is wrong and that we need to do something about it. C.S. Lewis, a writer from the middle of the last century, said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Pain shows us that all is not right. There is a problem that we need to address. And so we need to pay close attention to Jesus' final words on that occasion. We hear the same phrase repeated twice in this little story. In verse 3 we read, Unless you repent, you too will all perish. And again in verse 5, Unless you repent, you too will all perish. What Jesus is doing here, lovingly, is pointing us forward to the day when we will have to meet God. Now we know that we all will die. It may be next week, it may be next year. For some of us, it may not be for another 80 years. But death is the ultimate statistic. One out of one of us will die. And Jesus is clear that each of us needs to be prepared for that day when we will meet God and face judgment. And he says that we're all in grave peril. He says, unless you repent, you two will all perish. It's a warning for everyone. Pain is a wake-up call. If we're not ready, he says, we'll perish. We'll be cut off from God, from the one who made us and from the one who made everything that is good. Well, what we'll see next week is that Jesus has provided a way out, a rescue, and at great personal cost. And it's a rescue that's available to everyone. And we'll hear more next week about what Jesus has done so that we can be friends with God again. And he calls on each one of us to follow him, to trust him, to rely on him. Repent, Jesus says. Repent. And to repent is simply to turn around. Stop trusting in yourself, Simon, and instead trust in Jesus. Live for him and not for yourself. Well, 2,000 years ago, just outside the city wall of Jerusalem, Jesus paid the price for my rejection of God. His death on a cross secured a wonderful future for all who will trust in him. A future where tears and death and pain and suffering will be no more. And we'll hear more about that in coming weeks. Well, I just want to finish by encouraging you to uh, to look further into things. If you've not yet got a copy of this little book, uh, it's a book on which uh, much of what we're saying uh, these weeks in church is based. And it's available free within the, uh, the shop in Henham, or you can get hold of a copy from the church office. But as we finish, let me pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided warnings for us. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you'd help us to heed that warning. Help us, Lord, to look forward to the day when you will ultimately redeem the world from suffering and pain. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you'd help us to look into the person of the Lord Jesus to put our trust in him, knowing that he is the one who will get us through death and into the security 
of a wonderful relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we pray together? These prayers are based on Psalm 23, which you might know. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it, how majestic you are. We praise you for all your abundant provision on this new day. Thank you for caring for us as a shepherd cares for his flock, feeding them, protecting them and bringing them back when they wander. Thank you for the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the homes we live in and for family and friends to comfort and cheer us. Thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together, to hear your voice, even though we can't gather together physically. Thank you for providing the technology and the skilled people to make this service a reality. And we thank you for the hours of preparation Simon has put into his sermon, so we might hear your voice as he speaks your truth. But above all, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, our Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for us, dying on the cross in our place. Thank you that he knows each of us, his sheep, by name. He loves us, cares passionately for us, and brings all those who trust in him to eternal life. So, Please help us to trust in Jesus, our Good Shepherd, at this time of coronavirus. Help us to turn to him, knowing that he turns none away whom the Father brings him. Even, or perhaps especially now, when we wonder where God is, please open our eyes to see Jesus and marvel at the love the Father has lavished on us so that we can be called children of God. We thank you, Father, that you speak through your word in the Bible, that Jesus himself is your very word to us. Thank you that your word is true and unchanging, eternal and beautiful. It restores our soul. Thank you that your word comforts, guides, challenges, teaches, rebukes and shows us Jesus. Please open our ears to the truth of your word. We praise you for providing faithful Bible teaching online and thank you that lockdown gives us time to listen to it and reflect upon it. Please help us to stand on the authority of your word and not be tempted to water down the powerful gospel message. We pray for all those who preach and teach your word, for our preaching team here, for our youth and children's team and home group leaders. Help them to hold fast to sound doctrine in a world which increasingly takes a pick and mix approach to belief. And strengthen us all, Lord, so we may stand firm as the body of Christ in difficult and distressing times. May all we do be for your honour and glory. We pray for Christian agencies working against the backdrop of natural disasters and coronavirus. We pray for the work and mission of Sat7 and Barnabas as they seek to make Christ known in Muslim countries. And we rejoice that lockdown means more and more people are watching the Christian broadcasts put out by Sat7. Please, Father, bring many to know and love the Lord Jesus through this work. And motivate our hearts, too, to support our mission partners in prayer or financially, if possible. We pray for those who don't yet know Jesus and ask that you would place a deep hunger and thirst within them so they long to find out about him. We thank you for Christianity Explored online and we ask that many people 
would take this chance to find out about Jesus while they can. Equip us to speak of Christ to our friends and family. Please give us opportunities to be bold for the gospel, knowing that your Holy Spirit will give us the right words in your timing. We acknowledge that we do not live lives which show your glory, and we are sorry. Please forgive us, Father. Thank you that in Jesus we have a shepherd who cares enough to guide us and rescues us from danger, who rejoices to seek and save the lost. Please give us undivided hearts which long to know the Lord Jesus better and to love him more and more. Give us thankful hearts to respond to the salvation Christ has won for us so we may live out lives of willing gospel service, whatever the cost. And we pray that a deep desire to love the Lord Jesus and to make him known would bind us together as we seek to glorify God here. Thank you, Father God, that you are with us through the valley of the shadow of death, so we need not fear. We thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, that we can approach you in confidence trusting that we are covered by Jesus' righteousness. Father, there are many people on our hearts who are struggling just now in mind, body and spirit. We bring before you the lonely, the elderly, the anxious and the sad. Please comfort and strengthen them. We pray for those concerned about the future, whether it is in making new policies or concerns about jobs, finance, schools, or simply meeting other people again. And we thank you for Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who cares for us all. Please, may we trust Jesus at this time. We pray too for the sick and those who grieve. Might they lean on you and know Jesus, the faithful shepherd who walks alongside them in their distress. And we thank you, Father, for that promise of eternal life to come with you. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus at this time of great uncertainty, knowing that he is worth so much more than anything this world can offer, for he alone is priceless. Amen. Jesus taught his followers how to pray and we can say the Lord's Prayer. We can say this together anywhere and at any time. So together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you want to find out more about the Christian faith, just uh, keep watching the video. There's a, a short advert for our course, Christianity Explored. Um, but also, I'd urge you to pick up the book, um, coronavirus. Where is God in a coronavirus world? Now, Emu, we're going to conclude our worship by singing the hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. In a messy and difficult world, we are reminded that Jesus will return and gather his faithful believers to their eternal home. And this is a glorious hope that we are to rejoice in. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, that with you there is always hope. With you there is always a future. Help us to look to your Son, Jesus, who died for us, who brings us forgiveness and peace and a loving fellowship with you, our Lord and God. Amen. I hope you will join us again next week where we will look at the topic what does God know about our suffering? 
I hope you've enjoyed this service. I hope you find it beneficial uh, and, and has brought you closer to God. We close by singing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. God bless and goodbye.